Hey guys, Dr. Gary here, double board certified facial plastic surgeon. And this video a lot of people have been asking me for, and it's why I stopped doing buckle fat removal surgery. The outline for this video is procedural goals, the anatomy, surgical steps, a disclaimer, six reasons why I stopped doing buckle fat removal surgery, and an important exception to my practice. Procedural goals, why do people get buckle fat removal surgery? One, they want to reduce the mid-face fullness. People feel like they're just too full in the mid-face sometimes and they're trying to get that reduced. That's one way to do it. Another is to highlight the zygomatic prominence, which is up here, in the mandibular body. If you reduce the fullness here, then the, the bony structures become a little bit more obvious and some people like that. Also to improve on any soft tissue asymmetries that might exist in the face. And so now in terms of the um, anatomy of the area, the buckle fat is a deep fat pad that's located on either side of the face. It's between the buccinator muscle, which is the muscle like on the inner part of our cheek, and several other more superficial muscles such as the masseter, the zygomaticus major, and the zygomaticus minor. It's important to point out that the um, buccal fat pad is intricately intertwined with certain important structures, and that includes the parotid duct. It connects the parotid gland to the inside of the mouth via the parotid duct, and that's actually what sends saliva into our mouth. That's one of the glands that does that. Also, the buccal branch of the facial nerve is right in that space. The facial nerve, as you recall, is the nerve that controls the muscles of the face. We've got one facial nerve coming in like this, another one coming in like this. It actually splays through the parotid gland, and it then extends in and innervates a bunch of muscles in our face. So the buccal branch is one of those branches of the facial nerve that runs right where that buccal fat pad is. And there are also some important uh, blood vessels in that area too that have some considerable size to them. So just to touch on the buccal branch of the facial nerve some more, there are important muscles of the face that it supplies to allow those muscles to move. And that includes muscles like the rhizorius, we're gonna flash it on the screen, that's involved in smirking, levator labi superioris, which elevates the upper lip. And remember that one because I'm going to give you guys a story later on in this talk about a patient of mine and where that was very much implicated. Then we have also the nasalis that controls the flaring of the nostrils. So there are real, um, you know, kind of emotions and physical types of movements that are controlled by this buccal branch of the facial nerve. And again, it's running right through where that buccal fat pad is. So in terms of the surgical steps of a buccal fat removal surgery, first we mark out the parotid duct or where the what's called the Stenson's it's also called Stenson's duct but where that little papilla is which is that opening into the mouth itself so we mark that out just to know where it is so we can avoid it when we're making an incision and you also mark out the area where we're actually going to make the incision the cut on the inside of the mouth it's done either at the bite level when the teeth are clenched together where that bite level is or what's called the maxillo gingival buccal sulcus so it's it's basically on the inside side up there. Okay, so two different options for making incisions. The local anesthesia is infiltrated just into the mucosa, which is the inner skin of the cheek itself. So the anesthesia is not coming in this way. It's just like when you're at the dentist. It's going in on the inside of your mouth, just to anesthetize the mucosa. Once everything is numb, the um, incision is made, usually with cautery, usually monopolar cautery. We make the little cut into the mucosa. Take an instrument like a curved clamp and you spread through that buccinator muscle until you find this yellow buccal fat pad. It, it, it's, it's quite yellow in its appearance. And you basically then start to like tease it out of its pocket. Once you get it removed or partially removed, you buzz the base of that pad. Um, you control the bleeding in that way. And then you take it out and you close the incision with usually dissolvable sutures. It seems easy, right? Like what can go wrong? Not a big deal. Well, here's a video of me doing the procedure. I used to do this procedure but then I stopped.
So make sure if you're not subscribed yet to please hit the subscribe button and the notification so you know when we put out new videos since we're doing them more and more often and we're really trying to incorporate what you guys are giving us in the suggestions and, and doing all that. So subscribe if you, if you aren't already. Thank you so much. So now I want to get into like a little bit of a disclaimer here. Okay, so this video is meant to highlight my personal experience in my own surgical practice. It's not meant to suggest that by Buckle fat removal surgery should not be done by anybody. That is not the purpose of, of this talk. There are surgeons out there who get consistent results and have happy post-op patients, I'm sure, after this surgery and, and everyone's happy, right? My practice, it didn't really work out and I'll get into why. There are six reasons why, actually. Reason number one is that there is, in my opinion, too much patient discomfort during surgery if it's done awake. Most patients want to have this surgery under local anesthesia. This way you can avoid the risks of general anesthesia and you can also avoid some of the, the extra costs. Usually if you go to a doctor, a surgeon like myself, um, you're getting a procedure in the procedure room, that's just um, a flat fixed price for um, surgeon's fee, right? If you're getting something like say rhinoplasty, there's usually additional fees like for the operating room, for anesthesia costs, and, and that all adds up. So a lot of people are looking to avoid that if they can. And in terms of the numbing, you can numb the inner part of the cheek, as I mentioned earlier, but you cannot numb the deeper structures that are all like within the cheek where the actual fat pad is. That does not go numb. It's only the inside of the cheek, the mucosa, that skin that goes numb, the inner skin. So as you go and you tug on this buccal fat pad on these internal structures where the fat pad is, people actually feel like their face is like being pulled on from the inside, but that's actually what's happening. And it's very uncomfortable. Um, and I've had patients just be very unhappy during surgery. I hate that. I mean, I just, I don't, I don't enjoy causing someone um, undue discomfort and not really having a way to not cause that discomfort other than stopping the surgery or offering it to them when they're fully asleep. Reason number two, there are important structures where the buccal fat pad lives, as we talked about before with the anatomy, the facial nerve, the blood vessels, the parotid duct, they're all at risk during the surgery. You remember with that picture that we showed earlier, they're, they're all intertwined. What happens if the nerve is injured? Well, I actually had a patient that that happened to and you know we all as surgeons no one likes to talk about the complications but i think it's important because it obviously influenced me in in stopping the surgery and, and not offering it anymore or at least in this fashion under local anesthesia it was tough to find the buccal fat pad on one side uh, for this one patient so i dug i dug i kept digging very carefully and i was looking and you know i knew i didn't cut any nerves but there were times when she was in some discomfort and we ended up finding something that was likely the buccal fat pad. But then in the post-operative setting, really after a few days, she detected that there was a bit of difficulty elevating one side of her upper lip. And, you know, essentially I knew that there was some degree of either just swelling or potentially a little bit of, of, of nerve damage. And as it turns out, um, it really was the nerve that was temporarily affected. Luckily, it all went back to normal after three months. And that's usually the case with that buccal branch of the facial nerve, but it's very unsettling. It's unsettling to the patient, to the surgeon, and that happened to me. And so I'm sure it's happened to other people out there. It's reported in the literature. So again, that's that's a real risk. There's also some data in the literature, some, you know, not, not, not common, but there are some cases of massive blood loss during buccal fat removal surgery because of the maxillary artery, which is a big artery, being severed during that surgery. And people, you know, it was one person who almost died because he lost so much blood. I know a buddy of mine, another surgeon in town, who had a case where the whole cheek just became super swollen essentially with blood. So um, they lost a lot of blood, but it, it was maintained within the cheek. But it's an area that, that is quite vascular and, and there are some blood vessels. And remember, blood vessels, they have a general understood course, but sometimes they take 
other twists and turns and you may not expect that there's big blood vessel sitting right there where that buccal fat pad is and if you get into it, it it could spell some degree of trouble and then the parotid duct if that's injured then you could have issues with swelling and discomfort of the actual gland and the side of your face so lots of potential for injury and, and risk reason number three I don't think that it achieves the look that everyone's sort of hoping for and I'll explain what I mean there are patients who have some full faces, right? And they feel, they think that if they get this one surgery that all of a sudden it's gonna completely transform the appearance of their face and make everything look sculpted and how they envision it. It's oftentimes not the case. There are other fat compartments of the face that are a bit more superficial, meaning closer to the skin surface, and they're not going anywhere. It may be over time, maybe with weight changes they might change, but Otherwise, you're going to remain the same after the buccal fat surgery. So I find that either people are dissatisfied that, hey, it didn't really achieve what I was hoping for because they're thinking that the entire cheek will be reshaped, but that's oftentimes not the case. Or if you go too extreme and you remove a big chunk of that buccal fat pad, and if that was a big component of their facial structure, then they're going to look too hollowed out. And it's very difficult to reverse that. You can't just go and stuff the fat back. I mean, you can do a fat transfer, but it's not going to look the same. You know, it's going to look different. So that is another major reason why I stopped doing the buccal fat removal surgery. Now, reason number four, there was some anxiety on my part of not knowing if I'd be able to find both fat compartments going into the surgery and would I be able to remove an equal amount on either side. Now most of the time you go in, the fat pads are, are there, you find them and, and everything is fine, but I ran into situations where that wasn't the case where I had trouble finding the first fat pad and then you're like, do you go to the other side and start that? But then if you get it out on one side and not the other, will you have these asymmetries? And, and you would. And I just didn't like that feeling of like going on a bit of an expedition. And there are some surgeons who will tell the patients after surgery that, oh, you don't, you don't have fat pads, it turns out. That's not accurate. We all have fat pads. Some are slightly differently positioned. Some are a little bit smaller. Some are just difficult to kind of get to. Uh, but we all have them, so then you don't feel good about yourself as a surgeon if you go in and you have trouble finding them, or if you don't get the same amount out on both sides. I didn't like the, the feeling of like, just even when I knew I had a buccal fat pad removal surgery on the schedule, I just, I got this terrible feeling, I got like more anxious about, about things, and, and I just said, you know, it's not worth it. It's not, it's not worth that feeling for me, like I, I operate because I enjoy it, it's not just you know, to make money. I mean, yes, you know, I make a living out of it, but it's, it's really, it, I really enjoy the process of it. And of course, like, you know, doing it so that people feel better about themselves and all that, but, but I wasn't enjoying myself preparing or doing the buccal fat removal surgery. Reason number five, there's a lack of knowledge regarding the long-term effects of this procedure, the buccal fat removal surgery, and its role in facial aging. So we know through MRI studies that the volume of the buccal fat pad is relatively stable. It's const relatively constant in adults over your lifespan. But the other fat compartments that we have are usually not constant and they atrophy and they sag over time. So there's a risk that if you remove the buccal fat pad, say early in life, right, in your 20s or 30s, that later on when you've lost a lot of the other volume in your face and the buccal fat pad would have been there you know, constant and giving you some volume, now that's no longer there. So you get this additional hollowing. So you can get this almost like premature type of facial aging due to volume depletion. So there's, there's that concern. That was one of the other problems that I found. And then the reason number six is that many senior surgeons, meaning people who've been operating for 30, 40, years who I respect in the field and I have a chance to talk to on occasion, I found that they had stopped doing this surgery, this buccal fat removal surgery, long ago. I'm not saying all of them, but many of them have. I started asking around and that's what I was hearing, so I just felt that after the unpleasant experiences that I had had, and you know, you have to kind of listen to the elders as well. I just felt that, hey, like I think they were onto something in, in stopping that surgery. I just decided, you know, it wasn't the right 
fit for my practice and for me. It may work great in other people's hands, but just wasn't right for me. Let me highlight an exception here. So if you look at Ruth Bader Ginsburg, some pictures of her later in life, you'll see that there is some prominence in this buccal fat pad area. So this is called pseudo herniation um, due to buccal fat pad fascia weakening. The fascia is what uh, keeps the fat in inside of this pad and you can get some weakening of that fascia and you can get this pseudo herniation where it looks like it's almost sagging down and it's the actual buccal fat pad. So during a facelift or if there's another surgery that we're doing in that area and someone's under general anesthesia, especially an older patient, you could make an argument for removing that buccal fat pad at that time in those instances and that's where I still consider doing it. But it's a pretty specific indication and it's not the type of surgery that I recommend now for uh, my younger patients and really not even for most older patients. It's just a, you have to have that specific deformity with that pseudo herniation where in my opinion it becomes a good idea to do the surgery. So hopefully that helps clarify some of the reasons why um, you know, I, I've stopped doing the buccal fat removal surgery. I'm not trying to discourage all of you from doing the surgery, but I want you to know my opinion. As you know, I'm, I'm always honest with you guys, and so this is my honest take. Um, it's really the only procedure um, other than Kybella <laughs> in my practice, just because I didn't like very few people were coming for that and thread lifting things I had learned but I just decided you know it's not right for my practice but as far as surgical procedures that I had started doing in my practice almost four years ago now when I started it up until now and ones that I've stopped that's the only one so you know take it for, for what, what it's worth if you enjoyed this video on why I stopped doing buccal fat removal surgery please check out my video on lip lift surgery which is actually one of my favorite surgeries to do and click on the card and I will see you there thank you